Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Andrew Collins is a science and history writer who investigates advanced civilizations in prehistory. He's the co-discoverer of a massive cave complex beneath the Giza Plateau, now known as the Collins Cave. Andrew is the author of over a dozen books, including Origins of the Gods, Denisovan Origins, Hybrid Humans, uh, Gobekli Tepe, and the Genesis of the Giants of Ancient America, and his latest is The First female pharaoh, Sobek Neferu, goddess of the seven stars. Andrew Collins, welcome back to Coast. How are you? <clears throat> Hello, Richard. Yes, yes, good to be back here. Yeah, plenty to talk about. I'll, I'll say. All right, so uh, 12th dynasty in uh, ancient Egypt. What time period are we talking about? Uh, we're talking approximately 1800 BC, so about 3,800 years ago. Um, and this was the tail end of a period known as the Middle Kingdom uh, in Egypt. been very, very successful. Um, we're coming towards the end of it. And there had been a pharaoh ruling by the name of Amenemet III. Um, he, was, he ruled for nearly five decades. And um, at the end of that, it, somehow his daughter, his second daughter, Sobek Nofru, managed to achieve the incredible, and that was to become the first female pharaoh that had ever ruled. And right. it's an incredible story. And even though she was only on the throne for four years, she changed the destiny of Egypt because she basically saved the sovereignty of the country um, because just after her life, there was a very powerful dark age known as the Second Inter Intermediate Period where these Asian warlords took over the country known as the Hyksos. And if she had not established a, a, a minor dynasty called the 13th, which continued on in her name, um, who eventually would rise up against these, um, these warlords, then Egypt would have fallen. You would never have had the new kingdom. You'd have never had all the great kings like Ramesses, Topmosis, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, Hatshepsut. None of these would have existed. You know, how, did she become, how did she become pharaoh? Because she wasn't... Uh, first in line. She wasn't even second in line. No, no, she wasn't. No. I mean, her father had actually earmarked her, um, his eldest daughter. Her name was Nefertar. Um, and she was going to be married to her younger brother uh, and put on the throne to rule the country together. I mean, this is exactly what was going to happen. Even her name was placed in what's known as a cartouche, which is these an oval shape around your name, which shows that, you know, you are royalty and you are actually ruling the country. So she, she was clearly being lined up for that reason. But then she dies uh, very young, probably 16 to 18. Um, so her brother, her younger brother, takes over, and it seems as if Sobek Nofru suddenly then comes into the fray and rules with her brother, whether it's official or unofficial, we don't know. And he rules for about nine years. Um, and then he dies. Uh, and obviously we can get into how that might have happened. Um, and then she comes to the throne for four years. So he had no heirs, in other words? Well, he may have done. Um, because the first two kings of the next dynasty, the 13th dynasty, 
um, may well have been his sons, young sons. Um, they might. Some people have even suggested they could also have been her sons as well, Sobek Nofru's. But that's, you know, that's pure speculation. Um, and they revered her. Um, but there's every indication um, from what I put in the book that she, that she may have been involved with actually killing her brother. Um, or certainly gave the nod to it occurring because even though the two siblings were very close together uh, at the beginning of his reign, it would seem as if he was pulling the country in a direction which was disastrous. And basically he opened the borders and allowed um, people to settle in Egypt, um, which had been happening during the reign of his father, but now it was becoming too much and it would seem as if there was factions that were against this realized that Egypt would fall if this was going to happen and they went to Sobek Nofru and said look you know this country is going to fall apart if your brother continues down the route that he's going you know if we support you would you give us the the, the hand or the knowledge of how to get your brother and take him out basically pretty ruthless <laughs> well they had to be i mean you've only got to look at the ptolemies or the caesars or any other dynasty in um you know egypt or any other country rome uh, or greece uh, to know that this was going on all the time unless you were ruthless you would be pulled down you know you would be seen as weak and there would always be uh, you know factions or rivals that would want to take you out so we often think of these ancient societies as being patriarchal, and yet we have a, a woman, which she have, she's referred to as uh, ruling as a king. Um, That's right. Which is interesting. Why wouldn't she be referred to as a queen? Well, because queens had a very specific role, uh, and that was a, as a consult, you know, to the king, um, whereas she is very specifically said to be a king, in other words, the ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt. Egypt had two separate kingdoms that were brought together, um, you know, at the beginning of dynastic history, about 3100 BC, and that's Upper and Lower Egypt. And the, you know, a king would rule both of those, and that would show that they were in control of the whole of the country. And she was the first woman to actually bear that. That's on. That's actually on her inscriptions. Would she have? Uh, dressed as a man? Would she have uh, tried to rule, give all the outward appearances of, of being a man? Well, uh, because she was the first female pharaoh, um, I think a lot of uh, sculptors, um, you know, artists would have, and, and obviously writers, would have not really understood how properly to address her, you know, whether it be in statues, you know, in release, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you get this mix, this strange mix, that she's shown with, um, you know, a male kilt, which was what a king would wear, but also with quite feminine uh, dress on as well. And uh, the inscriptions are in both male and female. Um, and it's unclear exactly, you know, whether she's being addressed as a male or a female. I mean, it's, it's either one or the other. Now, whether this was simply because they'd never had a woman on the throne before or whether there was just confusion or whether she herself wanted to be seen both as male or female, we don't know, but that's the way that it seems to have been. And so Beck Neferu, break that down for us. What, is, what does her name mean? Her name um, comes from Sobek, which is the crocodile god, an incredibly ancient um, deity of Egypt, and Neferu, which means beauties. So her name is the beauties of the crocodile god. And the crocodile was incredibly important because um, the area that she ruled from is known as the Fayum. Um, this is a huge oasis about 60 miles to the southwest of Cairo. And there, there was a huge inland sea there, which anciently was known as Lake Morris. And there was a palace there. There was a temple of Sobek. And this is where she ruled from. And what she did was actually make Sobek almost into a monotheistic god um, and got the priests of every other uh, deity in all of the different districts um, in Egypt to come to the Fayum probably once a year to make offerings to Sobek, 
which um, she created this huge, great complex known as the Egyptian Labyrinth, which um, Herodotus, the Greek writer in about 450, reports was the most extraordinary building in the whole of Egypt, even more so than the Great Pyramid. So what were the attributes of, of the crocodile god Sobek? Why, why was he so important to Egyptian life? Well, I think it's to do with creation. I mean, he was seen as a form of the sun god, Ra. Um, it was believed by, by this particular dynasty, the 12th dynasty, that the sun at the end of the day would set down and then assume the form of a crocodile and swim through the, the, the waters of the Fayum Lake you know, during the night, and then in the morning would rise up out of the, the, you know, the eastern shores, assume the form of the sun disk again, and rise up into the sky. And this would seem to have been an incredibly ancient belief tied to the fact that they believed that the very first god was Sobek, and they, that he rose up out of the deep waters uh, in the Fayum, you know, and obviously climbed up as the sun into the sky. Now, his mother was a very ancient goddess known as Neith. And she was shown as an upright hippopotamus. And often, Sobek was shown actually on the back of Neith as a hippopotamus. And this was also important in astronomy. There was a sky figure made up of the stars of Draco, of Ursa Minor and Ursa Major, um, that turned about the so-called celestial pole, the turning point of the heavens. And it would seem as if this was incredibly and extraordinarily important to Sobek Nofru Re. And because of this, it would seem that um, she revered stars and would, would appear to have actually revived a very ancient cult of the stars, um, which continued on in her name um, long after her death. In fact, many of the kings that followed her in the 13th dynasty also bore the name Sobek, as if they were like servants of this very same god. So when she was made pharaoh, did she get to pick her name? Um, well, no, her, her name, that was her personal name, and that's obviously one of the reasons why she felt so strongly um, about this particular god. But it wasn't the only um, deity that she, she seems to have been associated with. Um, in her, her early years, it would appear that she was probably going to be a priestess at one of the temples, and I suggest that this was probably uh, the cult of the goddess Hathor, um, who was uh, associated with everything from music to dance to poetry, literature, but also sexuality and love. Um, and this would appear to have been the, 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 the temple that she was associated with. And it may well be that she was actually connected with this particular deity when she was brought up in the northern part of the country, what we know today as the Nile Delta, which was an area, actually, that had been settled quite strongly by Semitic peoples coming in from Canaan. So it's very possible that in her early years, she was mixing with people that are associated with the Bible, that particularly the book of Genesis. Um, the figure of Joseph, for instance, you know, the, 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 the son of Jacob that was sold into slavery in Egypt, but then rose up to become the second most important person in the country after Pharaoh, after he interpreted the, the dreams of uh, the coming famine in Egypt. He would seem to have lived at the same time as Sobek Nofru, and it may well be that they knew each other. Um, and this is quite a, an interesting thing to imagine, that Sobek Nofru may well have actually had this connection, you know, with this character from the Bible, Joseph. Is it possible she is she mentioned in the Bible, but perhaps under a different name? Um, no, I, 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 I looked very, very carefully. But what we do have is Arab accounts from the early medieval period, which were taken from even earlier Coptic traditions, that Christian Coptic traditions from, from Egypt, that talk about Joseph being involved with engineering projects, uh, in particularly cutting a canal from the Nile to the lake in the Fayum. Um, and it said that um, Joseph oversaw this um, on behalf of, of Pharaoh, and that Pharaoh is almost certainly Sobek Nofru's father, the III, because he was known to have been involved with those engineering projects. And what's interesting is that these accounts 
talk about Joseph being told or being asked if he would construct a palace for Pharaoh's daughter um, who lived in the Fayum. And I am certain that this is Sobet Nofri. Unfortunately, it doesn't give her name, but it refers to as Pharaoh's daughter, and I'm certain that, that it is her. So when she tried to um, create almost a monotheistic re- religion in Egypt, uh, you know, worshipping the, the deity, the crocodile deity, Sobek, did she, did she go on kind of a, I don't know, a, an infrastructure binge building temples and, and so forth? Um, well, it would seem as if most of her um, building projects were concentrated on the Fayum region. Um, there's very little evidence of her outside. But the problem is that that her um, particular reign was suppressed after she died. Um, the pyramid that was, that was destined for her, which was at a place called Mezguna on the Nile, close to the um, pyramids of Dashur near Saqqara, would appear to have been totally destroyed. Now, this seems to have been done in antiquity, and this seems to have been purposely done. Um, She never reached that pyramid, by the way. It would seem as if there is evidence that she would have been buried in secret, um, because it looks like at the end of her reign, somebody was coming for her. Um, I, I suggest that it was the priest of a... Um, the, the priesthood of um, the, of Ra, the, the sun god at Heliopolis, who had sided with the, the Semitic peoples that had come into the country. So Heliopolis was at the end of um, these routes coming in from Canaan, and a lot of um, Canaanite or Semitic peoples had settled in that region, and they embraced that and were a part of that new cult. And people have even suggested that there is a connection between Ra and Yahweh, you know, the, the god of the, the, the Israelites. But, see, what happened was that during her reign, she would seem to have closed the borders again, you know, because it was quite clear that people were saying to her, look, you know, you've got to stop this. You know, there are far too many people coming into the country um, and, you know, and taking, not you know, not just jobs, but actually taking control of the country itself. And the thing is that these these warnings were well-founded because two um, generations after her time, Egypt did fall to these, these Asiatic peoples. And as I said, they were, the, Egypt was taken over by the, the Hyksos, and you know, they ruled from the north part of the country, but they basically trashed the rest of the country. They left in place a very weak Egyptian dynasty that um, ruled from the south of the country, uh, in Thebes, which is modern-day Luxor uh, and Karnak. Um, and they luckily, because they'd been sort of handed the banner of sovereignty by Sobek Nofru, were eventually able to rise up against the the, the Hyksos and get rid of them. So uh, we just got about l- less than a minute here, but had um, she not been able to hold the the United Kingdom of Upper and Lower Egypt together, uh, although it would fall later, how would history, how would our world look different today, for example, if she hadn't even in those less than four years reigned, held Egypt together for that period? Yeah, I, uh, the, I think the world would have been a completely different place. I mean, how exactly, we'll never know, but it would have been different. All right. Why is it that we we don't know about her? Um, why was her hi- why was her history suppressed, Andrew? Well, um, up until the 19th century, the only reference to her was in uh, one chronicle of the kings that came out about 250 BC, where uh, she's known under the name Schemiophorus, which and is said to be the sister of the king that ruled previous to her, which is Amenemes, which is Amenemet the Fourth. She's her brother. So that's the only reference we have to her. And during the 19th century and the early explorations of the Egyptologists, they started to find her name on um, you know, buildings, things like this, and wondered who she was. I mean, you know, quite literally, she was new in the sense that people really didn't know anything about her. And what gradually came out 
is the fact that her reign had obviously been suppressed and that the monuments associated with her had been completely destroyed. Now, she is mentioned in a couple of so-called king lists, but others miss her completely. I mean, there's, there's one set at Abydos in the southern part of, um, of Egypt where it has all the kings... Um, you know, in this wall panel of, of all the different cartouches, all the kings, and it's got all the kings up to and including her brother's reign, and then none at all until the beginning of the New Kingdom, which is which starts with the 18th dynasty, which is where all the the, you know, the famous kings that we know uh, generally come from. So I can understand why they would um, not put uh, the kings from this dark age of, of Egyptian history, because maybe they just wanted to forget about it. However, why why leave her out? And why why is she the first king to be le um, left out? And it's quite clear that, that they blamed her for this, the onset of this dark age. Wrongly so, absolutely wrongly so, because it's clear that she actually kept Egypt alive and allowed it to prosper again in the new kingdom when that actually rose. And I think that the reason why all this happened is that she, that her death came suddenly. I think that there is evidence that she may have committed suicide, although she wouldn't have seen it in terms of suicide as we would do today. It was more like a ritual death. And I think that this probably was done, you know, using hallucinogens, um, psychoactive substances, you know, to quite literally allow her to walk into the afterlife. Um, however, all the indications are that her burial was in secret. Um, she was probably put in a tomb that was prepared for somebody else, um, probably an official, um, you know, and uh, that that tomb lies hidden to this day. And, you know, that's one of the big mysteries. Where is Sobek Nofro? You know, discovering her tomb would be extraordinary. Why, why, why did she take her own life? Well, because I think they were coming for her. I think that... Um, that because she had changed the policies of her brother, who had, um, you know, who, who was actually trying to create a brand new kingdom outside of Egypt in what is today the Sinai, um, centered around this huge religious center called Sarabat el Kadam. And he was turning away not just from, um, from, from Sobek, he was actually venerating the, 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 the sun god. Um, Ra, and in particular his creative form, which was known as Artum. Um, he was moving away completely from everything that her father and the kings before him had achieved. And as I said, they had this open borders policy, and it would seem as if he was, he was probably quite young and very um, influenced by the people around him. And I think that there were some factions that very clearly saw this as, being, as Egypt being taken in the wrong direction, so they appealed to her. So she changed everything back when she actually came to the throne. But the problem is that all of this would seriously have upset you know, some of these factions, and they would have been looking for any excuse to get rid of her. And it would seem as if in the third year of her reign, the Nile floods were particularly low. And this, is, this can be a disaster, because what it means is that the waters don't um, bring the rich nutrients to the Nile Valley, so that trying to grow the next season, you know, grain, whatever, would have failed. And this would have been just the sort of excuse that they would have, you know, used to try and say, look what this woman's doing. You know, she's, um, this would not have happened when, when her brother or her father uh, were, were ruling the country. You know, we have to get rid of her. And even though you know, that they couldn't have just pulled her down. I think that they were beginning to sort of find enough reasons to, you know, get rid of her, quite literally take her out. And what's also um, known is that some kings would actually commit suicide um, if there were low Nile floods. In other words, if famine came, because it would obviously be believed that they were not strong enough to actually rule the land, because quite clearly the king and the land were, were, were seen to be one. You know, in other words, the gods were with the king, the king was within the land, and all of them were interlinked. So that if there was any reason to, you know, doubt that this was the case, then quite clearly those rivals that would want to, um, you know, pull you down, as it were, would 
you know, come up and say, look, you know, you've got to, you know, you've, you've got to stop this or you've got to uh, abdicate or kill yourself or whatever it is. Uh, and so would the, would her enemies have also uh, concluded then that the God that she favored Sobek, the crocodile god, was also ineffectual and therefore yeah, should be replaced absolutely. with Ra. That's exactly it. Because, I mean, Sobek, obviously being a creature of the water, was associated with the Nile floods um, and, you know, was connected with regeneration, rebirth, and whatever. So, yes, absolutely. They would have seen uh, the fact that she was making the crocodile god, you know, into this mono- literally a monotheistic uh, religion, uh, definitely a state religion as well, would have been something that was pulling the the, the it, you know the, the country in the wrong direction. And quite clearly, this would have come from outside of that priesthood. And I think that the people that were coming for her was the priesthood of Ra, the priesthood of Heliopolis, who were quite clearly in the pocket of her brother. And I think would have been really really unhappy when he was taken out. So, um, I mean, you. You cast aside the the king or the pharaoh and their god. You have the whole regime change. Then something yeah. else goes bad, an, a drought, a famine, what have you. They toss out that pharaoh and that god. It's a, it's a wonder that Egypt had any sort of stability. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, you know, acts of God, you know, like famines and floods and whatever, is something which is going to determine how successful, how prosperous – a particular dynasty is. And this is why there are so many different dynasties in Egypt, because, you know, they all revolve around families that eventually fail for one reason or another. And, you know, natural disasters are easily a part of that picture. But um, at the end of Sobek Nofru's reign, that particular dynasty, which is the 12th dynasty, ends. Um, But luckily, she'd managed to you know, kickstart this 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 thirteenth dynasty, which seems to have been uh, founded by the two kings, which um, were the sons of her brother. It would seem, and they were the thirteenth. But it's important to point out that that wasn't the only dynasty that rose up at that time. The fourteenth dynasty ran concurrently with it. They ran from the northern part of the country in the Nile Delta. And that is considered to be a Canaanite dynasty. In other words, it was a strong Semitic Canaanite dynasty of kings. And it was they who made way and paved the way for the incoming um, Hyksos kings who came in probably from somewhere like northern Palestine or possibly as far north as Syria. Uh, And they were the powerful ones. They were the ones that changed everything when they came in. Uh, You mentioned uh, upon her death... uh that she, uh, her, the, the site of her burial is unknown, but it, unless I'm mistaken, it sounded like you were saying that she was supposed to be buried in a, in a particular pyramid, but that pyramid was destroyed. Yeah. I always thought that the idea of the pyramid as a burial chamber for the pharaohs was simply myth that there were, they were never intended to be burial chambers, that they were buried in the Valley of the Kings or, or someplace else. Are you saying that in some cases, pharaohs were entombed in, par- in pyramids? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, the whole pyramid building age was much earlier than her, well, I say, the, the age. I mean, certainly when it was at its height, um, during the reigns of pharaohs like Khufu, Khafre, Menkara, who were behind the, the three great pyramids on the Giza Plateau. Uh, and shortly after this time, you get what's known as the pyramid texts inside the walls of the pyramids that are the prayers, the spells, the sayings that a pharaoh must use to enter into the last afterlife. There was a very specific journey that had to be undergone. And this would appear to start with going to the, the western horizon and setting just like the sun, in other words, entering into some kind of underworld, And then going through that underworld, which is beneath the earth itself, and known as the Duat, and then rising up, just like the sun, on the eastern horizon, but then going to the constellation of Orion. And this would be the stepping on point to the Milky Way. And then the the, the spirit, the soul of the pharaoh was then expected to go to the north. 
um, to the so-called circumpolar stars, the stars that never set, that revolve around the, the center point of the sky, the so-called celestial pole. Um, and there they will enter the afterlife and also become as a star themselves. That, that was the journey. But it would seem as if during the time of Sobek Nofru, they were still building pyramids and they were being intended for use. Um, but the style and design of her pyramid was completely unique. I spent a whole chapter talking about this. The direction of orientation, everything was com changed. And also, it was aligned very specifically to one star. And that star was Eltonan, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Draco. Um, and this seems to have been a star that was particularly important to her. It represented the eye of the crocodile god Sobek. Um, so this is where this whole idea of her being the goddess of the seven stars comes into it. Because even though most people would have never heard of Sobek Nofru, the fact is we, we all know her in one way. And that's because she is the Egyptian royal female that rises from the dead in every horror film that has you know, a woman, every mummy that rises from the dead, it's her. And the reason for this is that all of these films are based on one book, and that's The Jewel of Seven Stars by Bram Stoker, the writer, the Irish writer of Dracula. Now, he bought this book out in 1903, The Jewel of Seven Stars, and it seems very much as if the main antagonist of the book, you know, this, this uh, Egyptian female pharaoh, is definitely based on Sobek Nofra. And the reason why he chose her is because some of the Egyptologists of that century were writing about Sobek Nofra and saying, you know, who is this woman? What, she seems to have been incredibly important. She seems to have created this whole cult, this religious cult, or revived this, this cult of the stars, the seven stars. You know, what, what more do we know about her? And that seems to have impressed Bram Stoker enough to use her in his book. Uh, so, I mean, is she deserving of that sort of literary treatment, or was, or was she more benevolent, or was she? I mean, I mean, everything that I found out about, I think she was a good woman. I think that she was doing what she needed to do um, to save Egypt, to continue what's known as Mart, which means cosmic order, you know, divine truth, and that's the ultimate aim of every pharaoh you know, to, to create that cosmic balance, you know, so that the, the country will continue creation, continue to prosper. And, she, you know, she was that. She, she was creating the cosmic order in Egypt, but at a price. And I think that the price was that when eventually she knew that, you know, people were coming for her, I think that she decided that for the, it was best for the country that she took herself out, that, so she committed suicide, she committed this ritual death in exactly the same manner as Cleopatra, remember. Cleopatra also uh, committed suicide at the end of her life and almost certainly in exactly the same way, literally walking into the afterlife by taking a cocktail of drugs. The whole idea of Cleopatra, for instance, being bitten by a snake and her dying through uh, snake venom is, is just a myth, basically. Ah, all right. When she took her own life, uh, she would have been surrounded, I, I would presume, by uh, priests who were dedicated to the god Zobek. Zobek. Uh, she would have had a retinue of you know, advisors and so forth. Would they have all been obligated to take their own lives as well? Um, no. I, I think that the prior priority would have been to uh, allow her body to be you know, given the correct... Uh, rituals and rites of passage into the afterlife. Um, I think this would have been the absolute priority. Um, of course, there, there's no guarantee that that actually happened, um, because if she was buried in secret, then she wouldn't have had the correct temples that would have been constructed for that purpose. These are known as the Valley Temple and the Mortuary Temple, and in each one, different rites take place before the body can be finally interred in either the tomb or the pyramid. So, you know, we don't know whether this actually took place. And if that's the case, then if our belief in, let's say, immortality and the afterlife is real, 
then what actually happened to her spirit? What happened to her soul? You know, is it did it reach the afterlife in the way that it's supposed to, or is it still out there somewhere? And the reason I, I say this is because you think of Tutankhamun. I mean, his tomb was found in 1922. Before that time, we knew nothing about Tutankhamun at all. There was a couple of references to him. You know, he was simply a name. But then, obviously, the discovery of the tomb makes him probably the most famous pharaoh of them all. You know, and his name will be remembered forever now. And is that not a form of immortality in its own right, the fact that you're remembered and never forgotten? Um, and quite clearly, those pharaohs that are almost forgotten because the ritual didn't take place or because their tombs are ransacked or whatever in antiquity, you know, do they reach the afterlife? Do they have that same type of immortality? And I think what we need to do here is to re-establish her as an important figure in Egyptian history, and just maybe that will put her back in the place where she should have been all the time and will give her that immortality. Uh, had her enemies um, gotten to her, her body first, would they have honored honored her wishes or would they have discarded her body in a dishonorable fashion? I think it's probably the latter. I think it would have been discarded in a dishonorable fashion, yeah. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why she probably took her life when she decided that she wanted to you know, leave this world. And then, obviously, it would have been up to her closest followers, uh, including, as you quite rightly said, probably priests of Sobek, um, to bury her and to bury her in secret. And as I said, there was a pyramid that was um, made for her, um, but it was never used. So quite clearly, she was buried somewhere else in secret. If um, if you had to, to to guess, where do you think her body, might, her her remains might be? Where do you think her tomb is? Well, the most important thing for her dynasty, right through to her reign, was the Fayum region. This is this beautiful oasis area where you have the the royal palace, you've got the temple of Sobek. Um, the actual lake itself was seen to be sacred and associated with the beginning of creation as a part of her whole religion. So to me, it's got to be in that area. I don't think it's, let's say, further north at places like Saqqara or Dashur. I think that it's very clearly in the Fayum area. And if I've got to put money on it, I'd say it's on the north side of the Fayum Lake because this was seen as the place of the ancestors. There was a temple there, which is still there to this day, at a place called Kazrael Saga, which is this very strange megalithic temple made of huge polygonal blocks. I mean, it's the most mysterious building, I think, in the whole of Egypt. And I've discovered evidence to suggest that she was involved with the reconstruction of this building during her reign. And I think that, therefore, there's a good chance that her tomb is somewhere in that vicinity. Uh, if it's there, would would she have been afforded the same um, type of burial as uh, Tutankhamun? For example, would her, you know, would she have a sarcophagus that's with, you know, gold leaf and 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 so forth? Well, yes, definitely. I mean, her, her sister Nefertar. Uh, was eventually buried in her own pyramid, a small pyramid in the Fayum area, close to the site of the labyrinth. Um, and this contained a massive uh, sarcophagus, one of the biggest um, in, in Egypt. Um, and also it would have originally had uh, two coffins, one inside the other, um, and inscriptions on it, which very interestingly um, crop up again uh, during the 18th dynasty in the New Kingdom, um, on the sarcophagus of Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut is a very um, well-known female pharaoh, and all the indications are that she modelled her particular reign um, on Sobek Nofru and saw her as her sort of like spiritual mentor, quite literally. Um, so since your book has come out, uh, I mean, is there a revival in the interest in Sobek Neferu and, and uh, you know, are there teams of archaeologists now trying to locate where she's buried? Well, um, no, is the honest answer. 
Um, I mean, very little has been written about her up to now. I mean, she appears in academic books, and she obviously gets a few pages in um, books about you know, the kings of, uh, and uh, pharaohs of Egypt. But this is the first ever biography of her. I've pulled together every scrap of, of information about her, every mention of her, every cartouche uh, found on temple buildings, every reference in historical literature, not only from uh, Coptic Arab traditions, but also from ancient Greece, where she would appear to be referred to under the name Nitocris. Uh, this is the name that's given in um, uh, Herodotus, the so-called father of history that was writing about 450 B.C., he talks about a female pharaoh in there called Nitocris, uh, which seems to unquestionably be her because it's written in a section that's all about kings from her, her same dynasty. And it said of this Nitocris that after her brother had been murdered, her brother the king had been murdered, that she assumed the, uh, the control of the country. Then it said that she took revenge on all of those that killed her brother. And uh, after that, she herself repaired into this room full of hot ashes and committed suicide. Now, this is a very strange tale, clearly, um, it, that's been sort of distorted um, across time. But I think that what this is, is telling us is that this is the story of Sobek. It's the story of the death of her her. Her, her brother, which I think that she certainly knew about the murder of him. Now, whether she was personally involved, I don't know. But the reference to the fact of, of her taking revenge on those that killed her brother, I think, was her, at the beginning of her reign, taking out anybody that was seen to possibly be um, to, to rival what she was achieving. And as I said, you know, we're dealing with a, a, a different you know, a different period of history where, unfortunately, for people to remain at the top, to remain in control of the country, they would have to do what they needed to do to achieve that and to stay in that position for the best of the country itself. You know, so if you were not ruthless, I don't think that you could possibly have remained on the throne for any more than a few months, let alone uh, four years. Why would Herodotus uh, have, have given her the name Nitocris? Why didn't he use her correct name if he was, in fact, no, referring to her? Nitocris refers to Neith, the mother of Sobek. Uh, and Neith herself is shown um, with generally um, uh, suckling two um, crocodiles, or two you know, crocodiles are suckling from her breast, I should say. Um, and she is obviously seen as the mother of Sobek, and it would seem as if there is every possibility that, Sob that Sobek Nofru not only venerated Sobek, but also Nitocris, sorry, niece herself, you know, the goddess, obviously the mother of Sobek. So it would seem that inscriptions probably um, contained references to niece. And there is one that I've, I've discovered that does seem to allude quite specifically to niece. And I think what happened was that because she was buried in secret and because her place of burial was forgotten very, very quick, quickly, that her memory was distorted. In other words, although her name was Sobek Nofru, although obviously she was probably, you know, the, 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 the person who would be um, seen as, as the, the patron, if you like, of the cult of Sobek, that eventually this got distorted, that she was almost like the mother of Sobek. In other words, Neith herself, hence the name Nitocris. The Israelites were definitely in Egypt at the time of Sobek Nofru. Um, they were the Semitic peoples that were living in the Nile Delta. Um, and the story of Joseph almost certainly relates to the reign of, of Sobek Nofru, her brother, and uh, their father, Amenemet III. So, in other words, you know, Joseph was a major player in Egypt. I mean, the Bible tells us that Joseph um, became the most important person in Egypt other than the Pharaoh himself. So he probably was vizier, which is, you know, the term for the, you know, the, 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 like the second in, in command in Egypt. And if the Bible stories are correct, 
then it would seem that there was some kind of famine um, that lasted for, for seven years. And this would seem to fit the evidence that we've got for her father's reign, because at this time, there was in exceedingly high floods, not low floods, high floods. And when there is high floods, they will completely drown the land and they will not be good for crops the following year. Um, and so this would possibly have brought famine. And this has been pointed out by uh, a number of uh, Egyptologists and have said that the story of, of Joseph and the famine seems to match exactly what we know took place during the reign of Sobek Nofru's father, Amenemet III. And there's also evidence from the discovery of some statues of Sobek Nofru in the north of the country, in the Nile Delta, a place called Tel El Daba, um, that she was personally connected with this area. She may well have been brought up in the Nile Delta as a child. This means that she would almost certainly have mixed with Semitic peoples who had already settled in that city at that time. And this is interesting. And my colleague, the Egyptologist David Roll, um, has written a whole book about you know, Joseph's um, you know, uh, role in Egyptian history. Uh, and he actually um, cites uh, the discovery of, of a house very similar to um, those that were found in Canaan at this time, where a, a statue of a figure, a human figure male, was found in the style and dress of a Canaanite that he actually believes is Joseph. And this is contemporary to the time of Sobek Nofru. That's remarkable. You're heading off to, uh, you're going to Egypt this November, is it? That's correct, yeah. I mean, um, we're going on tour uh, with myself and um, the Megalithomania crew, Hugh Newman. Um, that's, if people are interested in that, it's on andrewcollins.com. Um, and we'll, we'll basically be going in search of Sobek Nofru. I mean, obviously, we're going to all the obvious places as well, from the top to the bottom of Egypt, you know, including uh, the pyramids and everything like Nile Cruise. But I specifically wanted to go into the Fayum and go in search of Sobek Nofru's tomb, you know, or certainly to discuss where it might possibly be. And, yeah, let's hope that one day, you know, Egyptologists will take this matter seriously enough for them to actually go looking for Sobek Nofru's tomb, because I think it's out there somewhere. The first female pharaoh, Sobek Neferu, goddess of the seven stars, Andrew Collins is with us, and again heading to uh, Egypt uh, in search of the final resting place of the uh, crocodile queen in uh, November. And uh, how, how can people get, uh, become um, involved in that uh, tour? Um, just go on to andrewcollins.com. Uh, there's an event section on there. It's, it's on the front page anyway of the opening news page. So just click that and everything's there. Uh, the tour is arranged by my colleague Hugh Newman of Megalithomania. Uh, and we'll be going to all of these sites, including this strange megalithic temple um, on the north side of the Fayum Lake at Khazar El Saga, which is a, a total mystery. You know, it looks very much like something out of the Pyramid Age at Giza. You know, one of the temples there are made of these incredibly large polygonal, multi-sided blocks all slotted together. Uh, in fact, if you looked at it, it you'd say, well, you know, this, this could easily be in Peru or you know, um, some other more exotic place where a similar style of, of masonry was used, you know, in former ages. Um, and yet, quite clearly, here it is in Egypt, and it suggests, a, you know, a very, very ancient tradition. And I think that this area around this particular temple was seen as a place of the ancestors. You have settlements there going back to five to 6,000 B.C., um, you know, including stone circles and the stone tools from these people would have been everywhere. So it's very likely that Sobek Nofru and her dynasty saw this area of the Fayum as a, the place of the ancestors, the place of the beginnings, the place where creation started. And that's why the crocodile god Sobek was so important because it was seen as the most ancient god, a form of the sun itself that rose at the beginning of time. Well, if anyone could find her tomb, 
uh, Andrew, you know, you're the, the, the one that discovered those, that enormous system of caves and chambers and tunnels beneath the pyramids of Giza. Um, is there any up there? How long has that been now? Is that about 15 years ago? That was in 2008. Uh, 2008. The caves were discovered. And I mean, nothing has happened since that time. Well, other than the fact that a whole TV show um, focused around Zahi Hawass, you know, the, 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 the highest profile Egyptologist, um, showed him going into those caves for the first time. He didn't even believe that they existed, but a TV crew managed to get him into them. And he ended up saying this was the most exciting adventure he'd ever been on uh, in um, at Giza. So in other words, you know, he was absolutely flabbergasted. He had no knowledge that they were there. So, you know, if the, garden, if the guy that was in charge of excavations at Giza uh, had no knowledge of them, then quite clearly, you know, these were unknown up until that time. And, I mean, it was, a, you know, not just a privilege, but it was, you know, a sort of one-in-a-lifetime um, you know, uh, discovery for, for somebody like myself, you know, to, to actually track down their whereabouts. This wasn't just an accidental discovery. This took five years of research working with an Egyptological uh, researcher by the name of Nigel Skinner-Simpson, uh, trying to pin down exactly where the entrance to this underground system was. And we pinned it down to the spot. And I went there once in 2007, I never found it, and I just, just didn't, it was just too dark, just did not find the right spot. But then more evidence came to light of a diary account from uh, around 1820 that referred to these, you know, these cave, this cave system again. And, you know, through a very careful process, we pinned it down and said it has to be the same place. And so I went back there, and this time we, we actually discovered the entrance, just a small crack inside the tomb that led into this massive natural cave chamber that then led off into various different directions. And we got as far as we could go with, without, you know, without um, proper caving equipment. Um, the TV show, uh, which followed around Zahi Awas, also went in there, and they you know, went down a, a, a fur, even further. But they claimed on the actual TV show that it ended there. But the archaeologists involved have been in touch with me, and they said, no, it does continue on. And it can, continues on in the direction of the second pyramid. Um, not the first pyramid, the Great Pyramid, the second pyramid. And um, this was supposedly the location of the lost tomb of Hermes, Trismegistus. Hermes, the, the, tri, the thrice greatest. Um, it said that he is buried there, holding in his hands what's known as the Emerald Tablets. And these supposedly contain inscriptions which are the secrets of creation and this is associated with a secret chamber somewhere underneath the second pyramid i mean this this should be one of the considered one of the greatest archaeological discoveries in history uh, why isn't it um the simple answer is that i'm a non-academic i mean my background is journalism um which is obviously you know why i write the books so if a non-academic discovers something, then either it, it's got to be ignored or it's got to be claimed that we knew about it all along. And, I mean, I went to Zahi Hawass and sat down in his office um, and, you know, showed him the pictures of what we discovered. And he just sort of threw his arms up in the air and says, you know, you know there is nothing there. We knew all about this. Um, and, you know, you have found nothing, basically. And yet, as I said, a few months later, he's shown on television going into these very caves for the first time. Clearly, he didn't believe that they were there. Um, but once he did, he, he, you know, he was just flabbergasted that they were there. But let's point out also that these are very dangerous, these caves. I mean, not only are they full of, you know, hundreds if not thousands of bats, but also there are poisonous spiders down there. I mean, we, we, we saw white widow spiders down there. Uh, others uh, since that time have, have seen other types of, of, of spiders down there that are quite dangerous. So, you know, it's somewhere that has to be treated with a lot of caution. But as far as the Egyptologists are concerned, you know, that they, they, I don't know. I mean, they've got better things to do, I suppose, um, than, than investigate it. And yeah, as I said, the one of the archaeologists that was involved in that TV show is Zahir West. He said the fact that that's a natural cave system 
could mean that there's evidence of you know ancient humans there going back hundreds of thousands of years because caves would have been pretty rare in that area. They'd have been prime real estate. You know, there's no way that people would not have used them in the past. So it is a major archaeological discovery, and hopefully one day somebody will, you know, look at them felt more thoroughly. You found the clues to the entrance to this um, in this, you know, British Consul General Henry Salt's memoirs. I mean, I don't know. I've never heard of Henry Salt before, but how did you? I mean, how did you know to look in a British Consul General's memoirs for the clues? Well, well, I have to thank my my colleague Nigel Skinner Simpson for that. Um, he went to the the, the British Library um, and consulted some of the original material, but it wasn't enough to give us, you know, the full, uh, you know, understanding of these diaries and what what was in them. Um, we had to wait until they were actually published um, with a commentary uh, to actually read the, the, the full section. And this was in a, an academic book that most people would never have, have, have come across. Um, and there it was, you know, the reference to the caves and the fact that, um, that he'd been in them uh, with a, um, an Italian explorer uh, and had travelled uh, a distance of what they said was something like... Um, 300 yards, you know, something like 300 meters, and quite clearly this was somewhere that had never been explored on the plateau before. I mean, we knew about every single cave, every single, um, you know, um, well, I say cave, I mean, you know, tomb uh, that had been constructed into the rock, um, every passageway, and quite clearly this was something else, this was something different. That's why we knew it had to be set there somewhere and why it had obviously been lost for, for, for 200 years. And yet there, nothing's being done about them? No one, no, no further exploration? No. I mean, what's so interesting is that there's a brand new uh, museum um, it's called the, the Grand Egyptian Museum. It's just opening. And that's on the, uh, the southern, just beyond the southern part, sorry, the, the northern part of the Giza Plateau. And it will have a, an approach route from there going up onto the, the plateau at, uh, uh, at Giza. And that will actually now go almost right past the tomb, which, which is known today as the Tomb of the Birds, where these caves are. And I find that very, very interesting. You know, will they, you know, lock it away? I mean, shortly after we found it, they put a, a gate on it and locked them up anyway. Um, but... It's so interesting that this new path that will go from the Grand Egyptian Museum onto the Giza Plateau actually passes quite close to this tomb, which up until we found it, there was only one reference to it. And this was from about 1840 uh, by Howard Weiss and, and his colleague who had clearly been into the tomb and found the mummies of birds, showing that this was obviously a place of a cult associated with a god connected with birds um, and this was also a, a major clue for us because it obviously was associated with a deity and that deity was most probably the god so uh, not so back uh, sokar who was a hawk-headed god that was seen to be associated with giza and in particular its underworld because um, the ancient name for giza was rostow which means the mouth of the passages or the mouth of the caves um, and this goes back to dynastic times. So once again, it told us that there was caves to be found at Giza and that Giza itself actually got its original name from its presence, from, it, from its proximity to these caves. In other words, that was the reason why it was chosen in the first place for the pyramids to be built there. So do you think then the caves are the inspiration for the concept of the underworld? Um, well, yes, in a way. Because the, the Egyptians believed that at night, the sun, when it set, went through almost like this cave underworld, which was called the Duat. Um, and the Duat was seen to have a physical representation. Um, and this would have been seen in terms of caves. And I think that the original form of the Duat was seen to be beneath the plateau at Giza, so that what we went into was a form of the Duat underworld. Oh man, that's uh, and you found it. I mean, yeah, that's that is absolutely legendary. Well, I mean, uh, the whole story went viral. I mean, it was um, you know an incredible yes. discovery. 
um, particularly when Zahi Hawass, um, you know, when he gets to hear about it, puts out a blog saying, no, nothing was found, you know, nothing to see here. I mean, that, that was, you know, that in itself allowed the whole story to go viral. But as I said, he didn't believe in the fact that they were there um, until he was actually prompted to go into it by a TV crew who had read, you know, my book and had read the, the material relating to it and thought, oh, my God, this will make a great episode um, in... Um, <laughs> Um, in in this TV show, which is called Chasing Mummies, by the way, it was called Chasing Mummies, and there was a whole episode called Bats, and that was it just that's it's called just Bats, and it's all about taking Zahawas into this cave system. So check that out. You should be able to find that online somewhere. Well, she is now, and uh, as you as you point out, her her um, her resurrection is her legacy, and yeah. so um, she has been resurrected in large measure thanks to you, Andrew. Great job. May she live again. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Collins, the first female pharaoh. Sobek Neferu, goddess of the seven stars, available at Amazon and wherever good books are sold. Andrew, thank you. That's my pleasure. Thank you. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.